Good evening everybody, welcome to a special evening edition of IndyCar on Monday night. Uh, I must apologise for broadcasting so late tonight, but uh, it's been a really busy day at work and this is actually just the first opportunity I've had to speak to you today. So forgive the lateness of the hour, but hopefully what I have to say this evening you'll find uh, at least interesting, maybe even entertaining. Uh, at the beginning of this show, um, you'll see there's a little blurb at the beginning of it where I talk about Ruth Davidson and her return from motherhood to, well, basically back to being herself again, it seems. It didn't last long, though, all that good-natured motherhood and all those um, nice parental hormones all just seem to have evaporated and we've got back good old nasty ruthless Ruth again. And this time, she's being quoted by the BBC and... The first thing she's quoted as saying is a lie, which is no surprise to anybody really that a politician uh, in the Tory party should lie. But this one is an interesting one anyway. I just thought I'd mention it. That uh, the first one of the first things she's said on coming back is that she's going to uh, fight against uh, a campaign against a second independence referendum. Well, she's a bit late. It's already been called, um, but to campaign against it after she very clearly said the last time she was interviewed by the BBC on self-determination that Scotland should be allowed uh, to vote on the form of government that suits it best. And she supported self-determination, as did, incidentally, Jeremy Corbyn, who did not think that Scotland should be prevented from voting either. But now it seems Ruthie's had a bit of a change of heart. And today she's come out with... Um, Another outrageous pronouncement which basically says that Nicola Sturgeon um, agreed to respect the result of the referendum for a generation. Now, do you remember the Edinburgh Agreement saying anything at all about respecting the result of the referendum for a generation? Because I certainly don't, and I'm pretty certain if you look at the Edinburgh Agreement there is nothing in there about any generations of anything. It just simply says that both sides agree to abide by the result, which we have done for the past five years. But unfortunately, times have changed. The Tory party has made a monumental screw-up of the entire uh, British state by attempting to pull us out of Europe, and things have changed dramatically. So poor old Ruth is really a bit behind the curve here. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Ruth's come back and she's decided she's going to campaign against another independence referendum. Now, the question here is, is she going to campaign against independence or is she just going to campaign against us being allowed to have a referendum? Because the two things are subtly different. And I think, from what I can see anyway, that there is no way she is going to stem the tide uh, of Scottish fervour when it comes to wanting out of the UK at the moment since we have seen a four-point shift in support for independence in the last two days, from 45% up to 49%. Now that four, actually I suppose it's five points when I think about it, but anyway, it's, it's approximately 4% shift in our favour. So we're almost within a gnat's whisker of being absolutely evens with uh, the no vote. But we do now know that the, the poll that was quoted recently, which said that Scotland's uh, people now were almost 50% in favour of independence, forgot to mention that they hadn't actually polled anybody who was 16 or 17 who would be eligible to vote in this referendum. And they also neglected to say that they hadn't actually polled any European Scots, any European nationals who are settled and living in Scotland. So that would automatically put the yes vote up at least another two or three percent you would imagine but of course that's never going to be allowed to be seen in the British newspaper. So we're, they're up to their old tricks again this uh, once in a generation crap has been going on for some time ever since Alex Salmond said this is a once in a lifetime opportunity um, it's now been written into the Edinburgh Agreement by Ruth Davidson after the fact she is the most revisionist politician I've ever met. She's rewriting the history of Scotland 
Um, and it only happened five years ago, as if we've forgotten what was in the Edinburgh Agreement. I'm afraid I haven't forgotten, Ruth. And you make the colossal mistake if you think it says that we have to uh, respect the referendum result for a generation. That's just plain stupid. Nobody has written that in the Edinburgh Agreement at all. Section 30 orders don't mention anything about generations. And anyway, you've just had a generation, so that means we've abided by it for a generation, haven't we? So by your measurement, Ruth, you have just produced a new generation, so it's quite okay for us to have a referendum again, wouldn't you say? Anyway, that's, that's the ridiculous things coming out of Ruthie's mouth. Other good things have been happening this week as well. Obviously, the, the um, SNP's spring conference is finished. It finished on a, an enormously high note. People buzzing with anticipation, riding high in the polls. The polls are still climbing, as far as we know. And all the polling indications that uh, the Yes movement itself has been looking at in Scotland over the past few months have been indicating that support is over 60% when you add in 16 and 17 year olds and those who are European nationals now settled in Scotland. So it's pretty good to be Scots at the moment and probably pretty miserable time to be Ruth Davidson because no matter what Ruthie does, we know that her party is polling somewhere about 14%, maybe less, I think, down in England at the moment. The Brexit party seems to be doing even better than the Tories just now, even better than Labour, in fact. Uh, and so both the, the main UK parties are in serious trouble in England and Wales just now. Only in Scotland is there stability. The SNP, for all of their faults, are doing a good day job. And the list of achievements goes on and on and on. And another achievement uh, this week was the First Minister guaranteeing all European students that there will be no tuition fees for them, that they will continue to be able to study in Scotland as they can at the moment. And that Scottish students can also be assured that there will never be tuition fees as long as there's an SNP government at Holyrood. So these promises, these pledges being made uh, almost actually sound like election pledges, but they're not. They're, they're pledges to keep things as they are. This week in England, by contrast, we have had um, Damien, uh, which one is it? Damien Green, I think it is. I'm going to admit my Damien's right, but Damien Green, I think, who is the current uh, Secretary for Work and Pensions. And he is looking at the problem of... Um, individual social care for when we get old, or rather I should say for if you're English, when you get old. Because at the moment they don't have the same automatic right to free social care that we enjoy in Scotland. Why not? Because they're not being taxed enough in England. And now the Tories are actually talking about increasing the taxation on people over the age of 50, specifically people over the age of 50. They are targeting those who are approaching uh, retirement age or maybe 10 or 15 years away from it to get as much money out of them as possible to put in that some kind of uh, catch-all system so that some of them will have private insurance and some of them uh, who are unlucky enough not to be able to afford private insurance will have some kind of basic social care but it's not going to be as good as it is here, and it's going to cost them. There are going to be rises in England's um, national insurance contributions. People who are living in England will pay higher national insurance contributions. Uh, and there also will be this private system that the Tories are planning to set up. This is the creeping privatisation of the care system coming in as well now. We've already heard that the Tories are planning to privatise workers' health care in England and Wales by bringing an American company over to take over uh, the running of hospitals and medical services and to supply medical services that are commissioned by local uh, GP commissioning groups in England and Wales. It's not incidentally happening in Scotland. So things that are happening in England are a big mess at the moment and they are guddling around trying to firefight just now. We also know that in England the numbers of police officers have been cut by 41% over the last 10 years. We have almost halved the numbers of police officers in England and Wales. And they wonder why violent crime is spiralling out of control in England. And they have a knife crime epidemic in the capital in London. It's because they have cut to the bone. The Tory government's done what it always does. 
it cuts public services until there is nothing left. And then when people start getting stabbed, getting their houses getting broken into, there's an uproar and there's an outcry, why haven't you done something about this? Well, because we gave you a tax break. And because we gave you a tax break, we had to lay off all these police officers. So you can't have something for nothing, but English people have been having something for nothing for a long time, and now they're going to pay the price for that. In Scotland, yes, some higher earning taxpayers pay a little bit more, but generally we all pay a fair amount in taxation. And we don't mind it because we know that it is paying for our excellent health services and our social care system. Now, these are not perfect, by the way. We know they're not perfect. And the reason they're not perfect is because we're being starved of funding from the South. Any cuts in public funding in England are reflected in the Barnett formula north of the border. So if England cuts its public spending on health care, the money that we get through the Barnett formula in Scotland for health care is also cut, even though it's nothing to do with us. It's because England's cutting its health care, they cut the money we get as well. And this is something which has to stop. And the only way that can stop is if we separate from England, if we end the union as soon as possible. Scotland is losing approximately £28 billion pounds a year to the English Exchequer. Approximately, I say. Um, Scotland makes about £58 billion pounds a year in taxation uh, and revenues. It sends that to England. Scotland gets back about £30 billion. England keeps £28 billion pounds of our tax money. We never see it again, and it's not spent on us. It's spent on fixing the problems in England that have been caused by under-taxation and under-investment by the Tory government. And because of that, we have lost almost half of our revenues to struggling people in England. We're propping up the English social services system with our cash at the moment. And this is the exact reverse of the story that is being told to people in England who say that Scotland is taking all the money from their social services and denying it to them. So they're playing us off against each other. The Tories are saying one thing in Scotland and saying something completely different in England. Anyway, at the moment, um, Scotland is holding its own, but it can't hold its own forever. The British government, we know, is planning to fully privatise the NHS as soon as they can manage it. And the creeping privatisation of workers' health in England will produce a two-tier system like the American model, where those in work will have workplace um, health care insurance. And if you don't have that, you'll be relying on a very, very poor national health service supported by a tiny amount of taxation in England. And it's not going to be anything like as good as things are here in Scotland at the moment. If all of that happens, if they continue to keep cutting and trying to privatise healthcare in England, it will affect Scotland. Although they're not going to privatise our healthcare, they can't do that. They're going to keep cutting it. And if they, if they cut health funding and bring in private health care, then Scotland's health funding will dry up and we won't have anything to replace it with. And we are not going to try to privatise our health care, so we would need to find that money from taxation. The only way we can find that money from taxation is if we separate and end the union and get back the £28, uh, 28 billion pounds a year which is being robbed from us to pay for England's poorly planned and poorly run and poorly managed economy. The separation of Scotland and England is now inevitable because the Scottish system wants to have a publicly funded health system. In order to have that, we need to have all of our tax money when we need it. £58 billion, pounds, not £30 billion that England gives us back of our own money. All of it. And the only way we can have all of our tax money is if we do not give it to England at all. And that means we must end the union. It's imperative now. If we are to save our own health service, we can't wait any longer. Now, speaking of can't wait any longer brings me to another subject which I was very pleased to see covered by the First Minister this week. The First Minister has declared Scotland is in a climate emergency. She's acknowledged what Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish activist, has been saying on a tour all around Europe to the political leaders of every uh, European state who listen to her, that 
The climate catastrophe is almost upon us. We have only a decade in which to drastically change everything that we do in our society and change the way we live. We have to stop burning things. We have to stop cutting down forests. We have to start planting forests. And we have to do it on an enormous scale. We have to plant millions of trees, not uh, pine trees, although there will be some, but broad leaf trees, oak, ash, sycamore, beech trees, plane trees, um, chestnut trees, willows, all kinds of uh, broad leaf, what we call hard hardwood trees. These are essential to both leaching carbon dioxide out of the air and fixing the carbon and converting it into wood, converting it into more trees. This also stabilizes the soil, it stops soil erosion, it improves soil fertility, it creates shade, uh, and generally does the whole country a lot of good. Remember that the barren hills and mountains of Scotland were not barren at one time. A few hundred years ago, the whole of the Western Highlands was carpeted in an entire forest called the Caledonian Forest. It was all cut down by farmers, by landowners, by grouse moor owners and by others who wanted to put sheep on the land. And the sheep monoculture basically has denuded the landscape of tree cover. It has caused land erosion, it has caused loss of soil, it has caused loss of hundreds of species of wild animals that were indigenous to Scotland over many hundreds of years. And not just have they cleared the highlands of people, they've cleared the highlands of wildlife as well. And it's our responsibility to put it back again, to undo the harm that was done by our ancestors, by our grandparents, by our own parents and by ourselves. And to hear Nicola Sturgeon acknowledge that there is a climate disaster. We are in the middle of a crisis. It's, it's climate chaos that's coming. Scotland is not immune to it. We're used to rough weather. We're used to difficult conditions. But the violence of the weather is just one symptom. There were reports this week that salmon returning to the Tay River are at an eighth of their normal numbers. An eighth. You know, you're talking about a tiny percentage of the fish that should be in that river have come back this year. And the reasons are many, but they're to do with the warming of the oceans, the changing of the um, the way the food chain is, the dying out of kelp beds, of coral reefs, the uh, increased amounts of algae, which grows in the water and basically suffocates all the, uh, the living organisms in the sea. All of these things are happening offshore, out of our sight, and it's accelerating. And it is, it's not alarmist to say that it's accelerating much more rapidly than anybody thought it would. Species are dying off by the hundreds every day. Amazon rainforest has been cut down at a rate which is astonishing. There's a, a there's a, an area of Amazon rainforest in in in, Amer in South America, the size of Belgium, which has been clear filled, cut and logged illegally, right? Nobody has stopped them. And the corruption and collusion of governments is at fault here as well. Now I know we can only do what we can do here, but Scotland is in a unique position because when we do break the union with England and we do set out on our own journey to put right the wrongs of previous generations and to try to repair the, the um, environmental damage that we have done over many centuries of coal burning, of oil burning, tree felling, and over extensive farming where we've exhausted the soils. The soil's so poor in some places that you can't grow anything on it. These things need to be changed, and the way to do that is to replant trees by the millions, among other things. But one of the most important things is to reforest the rest of Scotland and the Highlands. And not, as I say, not just with pine trees, but with native species broadleaf trees, but also Scots pines, Douglas fir, uh, maybe even redwoods and other giant-sized uh, trees which grow very well in cold and cool, wet climates. All of that can be done, and it should be being done now. The Scottish Government is doing a good job of other things, and I wanted to point out that uh, both the Orkney Ferries, uh, or I'm trying to remember what they're called, but the the 
the publicly owned company which runs Orkney Ferries and uh, Ferguson Marine and the European Union are putting together the world's first hydrogen powered ferry and this will be the very first entirely green environmentally propelled ferry in the world anywhere a proper ship which will run on hydrogen that's produced on Orkney tanked into presumably into hydrogen compressed tanks and shipped on board the ship so that the, the wind and tidal energy from the island actually propels the ship that keeps the island in contact with the mainland. It will be a world first for Scottish shipbuilding and Ferguson Marine is at the forefront already and this is the kind of thing that Scotland is going to be brilliant at and it's the kind of thing that will only happen if we gain our independence and it will happen at an increasing rate. We don't need to build warships to make uh, to make ships on the Clyde or anywhere else, in fact. We need to build the ships that are required for commerce in the next part of this century. And those are going to be exactly this kind of thing. Hydrogen-powered ships. Ships that are powered by hydrogen created by renewable energy offshore. It's the perfect fuel. It can be used to drive electric motors, believe it or not. Hydrogen can run through a, a thing called a fuel cell which combines it back with oxygen, and when that happens it produces vast amounts of electricity. So the hydrogen's like a battery, and you can drive huge electric motors to power a ship through the water without any pollution whatsoever. And we have that technology already. The Germans have developed uh, the same technology for trains. We should really be employing that, as somebody said to me the other day, to run the trains from the central belt to Inverness. Instead of electrifying the line and wasting billions putting cables all the way up hundreds of miles, why not invest in trains that don't need cables, that carry their electric power with them and can take, you know, carriages from the central belt all the way up to Inverness entirely by electric power without emitting a single gram of carbon dioxide. It's all happening now, it's all beginning to happen, but it will only happen if we defeat people like Ruth Davidson. Ruth Davidson represents the dinosaur party. She, she is the past. Her party represents the past for Scotland. The SNP and the Greens, the Socialists and many other non-aligned people and activists who do not have political parties, they are the future. They're the vanguard for the new Scotland that's about to emerge. And I would advise all of you to go online and look up these facts that I've been talking about tonight. Look up the hydrogen-powered ferry, the hydrogen-powered trains in Germany, and look at what Scotland's doing. We're already at the cutting edge. We have, some of, we have the most ambitious target for decarbonisation of any country that I know of. We are going to decarbonise the whole of Scotland by 2050. That means inside my lifetime there will be no more uh, carbon fuel burnt in Scotland. Not, not a thing. Uh, cars, buses, lorries, trucks, ships, everything. Even aircraft will probably have to be propelled by something different. It's all starting to happen. <clears throat> and Scotland is at the focus of it. And it's important that we remember that. That's it for this evening. I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. I'm heading home for the evening now. But um, just remember, Ruth Davidson is back. And she's broken all her promises and she's lying already. So it's back to business as usual for the Tories. But as far as we are concerned in the independence movement, we're moving forward into the next century and we're going to leave them behind. I'll see you all later. Have a great evening. Bye-bye for now.